Welcome to my CCNA Security Chapter Review. Here we're looking at Chapter 7, Cryptographic Systems. We're looking at five major categories. Basic Cryptography Services, Basic Integrity and Authentication, Confidentiality. Uh, we're going to get into some PKI, or Public Key Cryptograph, and we're going to end with a quick summary. So again, Cryptographic Services. Our goal is to explain what cryptographic services are, describe cryptoanalysis, and give you a basic working understanding of why cryptology is as important as it is. We're also going to look at the requirements for securing communication using CIA. So secure communication comes in meeting CIA confidentiality, integrity, and typically availability. However, when we talk about cryptographic systems, availability becomes authentication. And here they like to do play on words, so they don't like using the traditional CIA, they'll do it backwards. Honestly, it doesn't matter the way that they do this. CIA is pretty common in a non-Cisco environment, so like a generic security review process, CIA is going to be the order that it goes in, not AIC. Anywho, authentication is validating that you are you. Normally you can do this one of three or four different ways. Something you know, something you are, something you have, or possible location. For example, dual or multi-factor authentication for accessing your bank account. You have a debit card, that's something you have. You know your PIN number. That way, those two combined get you access to your bank account. Data integrity, basically it's confirming that whatever was sent is what was received. Data confidentiality is making sure that only those authorized to read your message was able to read your message. And this is typically done with forms of encryption. So moving on, cryptograph. Cryptograph typically deals with plain text that will be ran through an algorithm and becomes ciphertext. And this is created using several different types of methodologies. You can have a transportation, you can have a substitution, or a one-time pad. Here we have an example of a not really a, a substitution, it's more of a, a transposition, where you take your letter, we add 3, and that's the new letter. So A plus 3 becomes D. B plus 3 equals E, and so forth. However, they don't have to be plus 3. They could be plus whatever. Here's a transitional cipher. Uh, you'll notice here what they're doing is lining up the words and maybe using every so many uh, dots to create a new location. Transposition. Substitution is more of a plus three methodology. I said transition at the very beginning and I meant substitution. And that way, again, this is a simple, easy way to do an unread message. However, this one is kind of easy to break. We also have what's called a one-time pad cipher. And this is where there are many different ways to do this. The most common is the OTP, also called the Vernum cipher, or the perfect cipher. It's an algorithm where plain text is combined with a random key. It only exists mathematically, and it's an unbreakable encryption. Cryptanalysis is the analysis of breaking cryptography, breaking or cracking those codes. Common methods could be brute force, ciphertext methodology, uh, looking at known plain text methods. We have a chosen plain text or pl uh, chosen ciphertext methodology, or we have a meet in the middle type. It really all depends on the type of cryptography system that they're using for you to be able to break these codes. 
methods for cracking the codes, deciphering them using some type of frequency analysis. Cryptography as a whole typically is cryptograph plus cryptoanalysis together is about being able to make and break the secret codes. If we're looking at a crypt, a crypt analysis in SA, these are going to be uh, more of a specialized person that is used for breaking codes. So let's talk about the secret keys. What are they typically? If we're talking integ, I'm sorry, I'm going to do the CIA. Confidentiality, those keys are going to be like DES, triple DES, AES. If we're talking integrity, MD5, or SHA, those are hashes. Confidentiality is going to be more of the encryption. If we're talking authentication, we're talking a hash message authentication control, an HMAC, MD5, or SHA-1. So let's talk about basic integrity and authentication. Basically, we're going to be looking at MD5 and SHA and how they're used and how they're used to secure data communications. We're also going to look at HMACs. We're also going to look at understanding the purposes of our hashing values. Let's talk about hash values. Cryptographic hashes. Hashes are a way uh, this will be a fixed length value that we can use to identify the authenticity or the integrity, not authentic uh, authenticity, but the integrity of a file. For example, if I have a Word document and I take it and I email it to you and I send the hash value, you can actually hash the same Word document and if it's the same hash value, you can know it was not modified. However, if I send you a text document and someone captures it and adds another word, a space, one character, anything, they modify it at all, and you hash it and you compare the hashes, they are not the same. Typically, there is a length. There is the hashing that, uh, function that will compute to a hashing value. The length can be modified. Very few files will ever have the same hash value when the content is not the same and that's called a collision. And that will happen occasionally but it's very very rare. Here we have you know two types of messages and they're pay statements. Pay to Alex for one amount, pay to Jeremy for another amount. And when they are hashing, they're different hash values. So how do we use the hash values for verifying integrity? That's what this next chapter does. If we're looking at the message digest or MD5, it will go through a MD5 hashing function and then the hashed message will be a 128-bit hashed message and again you can take any type of file or object and hash it that way you can calculate hashes like that and then you can use those hashes to identify and to verify the integrity of the file when you are sending it. We have what's called the SHA SHA or secure hash algorithm that will also produce a hashed message typically at a 160 bit. Here we have the different hash values MD5, SHA1, and SHA256. SHA256 will be a 256 bit value. We also have SHA512 which will be a 512 bit value. So we can also have what's called the authenticity with a hashed message authentication code or HMAC which is a key hash message authentication code 
basically you could do a message with a secret key put it through this hash uh, function and it forces it to uh, verify because you may be able to intercept the SHA or MD5 messages and then rehash the values and then reship the new hash but with this type of algorithm you can't because if you don't know the secret key you don't know how to rehash it here's an example we take the data with the shared key hashing algorithm and that way you can verify the authenticity of the message or the integrity of the message because both ends will know the secret key and when they hash it if they're not identical then they know they're not the same hashing in Cisco products typically there is a entity authentication uh, sorry there, it's built in a lot of these devices it's hardware based there's a software based portion but again we're dealing with integrity we're dealing with authentic, uh, authenticity and we're also dealing with the authentication of the devices themselves we can look at things like key management key management is always one of my key nice areas to review because there's a lot dealing with keys that we don't always think about like symmetrical and asymmetrical which I don't think we're going to get into quite just yet so characteristics of key management are things like generation verification how we exchange them assuming we exchange them storage lifetime life cycle and how we revoke and destroy keys once they're no longer necessary now keep in mind that key lifetime is actually the lifetime of the key how we store the keys and I'm looking at key exchange because again if we're dealing with symmetrical keys the same key is on both sides. If we're dealing with asymmetrical, we have a public and private key, and so key exchanges take on a whole new meaning. So let's talk about a few key uh, lengths and key spaces. Here we have things like AES. Uh, it's the Advanced Encryption Standard, official standard since 2001. It's a symmetrical key. It comes in 128-bit, 192-bit, 256-bit, it's a high-speed encrypt uh, synchronous. Sorry, it's a high-speed symmetric key, and time to crack. Again, this slide is slightly older, so we're talking 150 trillion-ish years, assuming a computer could try 256 keys a second. The length of time for decrypting or breaking. Is actually a lot lower, no, not a lot lower, but is lower now because we have a little faster computing things, but that's off topic. Anyways, resource consumption for AES is fairly low. If we're looking at DES, DES comes in multiple bit versions, and there are the appropriate key version uh, possibilities. Again, we've already talked about symmetrical and asymmetrical. Symmetrical being the same key for both. Asymmetrical being different keys for uh, either side. A digital signature and hash keys. Hash signatures are, or sorry, a digital signature. You'll notice they're very similar to our hashes. And depending on the text you're reviewing, sometimes they're interchangeable. Choosing the appropriate uh, cryptographic key, shorter keys typically mean faster processing, the less secure. Longer keys, longer to process, but more secure. We need to find a balance between the two. Last section, or sorry, not last section, but one of the last sections, 7.3, deals with confidentiality. We're going to be looking at how encryption works, how it provides confidentiality, how uh, the different methodologies, or sorry, the different um, encryption methodologies, how they work, how they function, and we're going to describe the function. We're going to describe function of things like the software encryption algorithm and the RC algorithm. Encryption 
is the ability to take something in plain text and to encrypt it so it's no longer readable. Two major types, symmetric a versus asymmetric. Symmetric, shared secret, both keys on both sides. Asymmetric is different keys on either side. Key links are going to value depending on who you speak with. Algorithms for symmetric are usually faster, versus algorithms on the asymmetric side are a little bit slower, but they're more difficult to uh, break into. Symmetric ones are going to be things like AES, Triple DES, RC, and Blowfish. Asymmetric will be RSA, elliptic, or the ellipse, sorry, the elliptic curve, and DH. However, normally test questions deal with AES versus RSA. A very common question is, what's the difference between AES and RSA? Again, AES is a symmetrical key. RSA is an asymmetrical key. Again, pre-shared key, same key for both encrypting and decrypting. With symmetric, with asymmetrical, different keys for encrypting and decrypting. You'll have an encryption key and you'll have a decryption key. The symmetric encryption, things like AES, triple DES, SIL, and RC, they're the appropriate bit, uh, bit links. And again, depending on how we do our ciphering, we can actually manipulate a little bit. If we do what's called block ciphering, we're not doing bit by bit. We're going to be doing groups of bits. Hence the block, because group or block of bits. We can also have what's called a stream cipher. And the stream cipher is one bit at a time. And there's pros and cons for both, just kind of depending on resource utilization and time and understanding of cryptography systems. Uh, I've actually done both. It's just a matter of the equipment that you're working off of. So how do we choose the appropriate encryption algorithm? Normally, you want the strongest you can get, AES or RSA. But understand that there are pros and cons for both. Uh, compatibility is a very common issue. Triple DES is very common just because it was easy to implement. Not because it's super strong, but because it's easy to implement. Data encryption standards. DES is a very common one, very similar to AES in terms of it's a symmetric key. However, DES is kind of lacking in the key size. And you'll notice time to crack, we're not talking a whole lot of time for cracking. We have what's called triple DES, and it is DES three times. More keys, and it actually is encrypted three different times. It goes through the key three different times. AES Origins. I don't know why we're talking about AES again, because it's the same slide from a few slides ago. But this is, on the symmetric side, the type of encryption you want to be using. High speed, good key length, and overall, takes a long time to break. Here we have the ability to do an AES summary. You can do a passphrase or a password. You can break it down into a... Sorry. You have a password or a passphrase. You have the plain text that you want to encrypt. And you have the ability to encrypt it and then decrypt it. Alternate encryption algorithms. Things like SIL. And SIL has several restrictions. The Cisco router and Pure must support IPsec, but that's very common. Cisco router and the other Pure must run an iOS image that supports that encryption type. The router and the Pure must have hardware IPsec encryption. Ah, so, before we've been talking about predominantly software-based uh, software encryption. But here we have to have an additional hardware piece for decrypting our software-optimized encryption. Notice it's an asymmetrical key a little bit larger in the key size 
it's fairly uh, high speed and length to break they haven't really calculated that out yet though this is supposed to be the better of all of them but not really widespread yet because of that hardware component RC algorithms RC6 is a very common one today RC5 but you'll notice things uh, the bits uh, P size and bits have been increasing but you'll start noticing the timeline and again the type of algorithm how they do it I use RC6 for my block cipher early 2000s we have our DH or our Diffie-Hellman key exchange which remember this will be an asymmetric it's low but it has a very large key size it has some use for consuming uh, resources but it's considered very safe we actually have the shared the secret and the calculation and that's how we get the appropriate operations what I really like is when we talk about DH that feeds into our PKI section 74 is our public key cryptography, uh, cryptography sys uh, system chapter or exchange PKI is the public key infrastructure and we're going to talk about digital signatures a little bit more in depth we're going to look at a little bit more in depth with the symmetric and asymmetric encryptions and their intended applications and we're going to get into the PKI the nice thing is this builds on to chapter 8 with VPNs because we have to understand our encryption and our DH because our Deli Heifman actually comes in a lot in our next chapter asymmetric versus symmetric some asymmetric we have to have things like uh, some type of key exchange whether it be Ike internet key exchange we also have things like uh, SSL SSH and PGP encryption all of them are asymmetric algorithms where you take plain text you have one key for encrypting it you have a separate key for decrypting it public for, uh, plus private key this normally means it's kept confidential basically you share your public key with people and the public key can be used to decrypt messages here's an example we have Alice we have Alice's private key it will get go through an encryption algorithm the private key or the encryption portion plus the public key which will be used to decrypt the message should make for a authentic, uh, authenticated message with integrity meaning you can trust that whoever sent it used the appropriate key so you trust them a little bit more here we have a public key using plain text encrypted algorithm will get ciphered through you can also do the same thing with hashes and then they can be decrypted the same way DH uh, DSS or DSA RSA RSA being again an asymmetrical key DH is something that you really want to understand for VPN technology but they do have a fairly large uh, key length though normally you're not dealing with DH when we're talking about encryption it's, a, it's something that you're going to be using but a different type of encryption when you're looking at to encrypt files or encrypt communication DH comes into play as part of the VPN functionality but not the mainstream we're going to be using more mainstream technologies for encryption such as uh, symmetric AES or asymmetric RSA encryptions let's get into digital signatures signatures uh, for authenticity and to make sure that they're unaltered that they're not reusable that you can uh, 
not remediate. Basically, uh, they're reputable, meaning that they're not repeatable, meaning they cannot be repudiated. Basically, they cannot be, uh, you can't force it or fake them. Digital signing code provides several assurances about the code. It's authentic. It actually came from the uh, publisher. It has not been modified. We have digital certificates issued to typically an expiration date and we have the appropriate certificate authority issuing the certificate. Using a digital certificate you can confirm, encrypt, and send. Here for sending a digital certificate we would confirm the order, hash it, encrypt it, send it out to a signed uh, body who would give us or issue our signature. If we're talking about receiving a digital signature, again we go to that key exchange. We have certificate authorities that would issue our digital certificates. And we trust those dig uh, dig we trust those certificate authorities because those are the people that we as a society has charged with verifying and distributing those digital certificates on the public's behalf. They're assigned as a, a certificate authority for example. Just for completeness sake, digital uh, signature algorithms, we have RSA and DSA characteristics. Moving into our last major topic, we have our PKI or public key infrastructure. That is how we actually distribute our different types of keys. You can verify your identity with a certificate authority and once they have verified, they issue some type of certificate to you that shows that they trust you and that we should trust you. So we have a certificate uh, store. We get a certificate request. We send it to a certificate authority. The authority will update the database and issue us a certificate. We can now converse online and people that trust that certificate authority can now trust us. We have different classes used for purpose in which no checking has been performed. Uh, class 1 is used for individuals with focus on verification of email. Uh, when proof of identity is required for the organization. For servers and software, that's going to be class 3. Online business transactions, 4. Private organizations or government security, they're going to use class 5 certificates. Basically, when you go, I want a certificate for this purpose, it will be uh, a specific class because you pay extra for the different types of classes. But the higher the class, the more secure they are. When you go on to access a website, Google, for example, that's going to use SSL that will use HTTP over SSL, so that's a form of digital signature. We can actually have an internal certificate authority, and as long as everyone in the, inside the entity or the organization trusts that certificate authority, we can have other things that will use that certificate authority to verify identities. Instead of using a public certificate authority like VeriSign, for example. We have different types of public key cryptography standards. PKCS 1 through 15, and there are the appropriate standards, RSA, DH, password-based, extended certificate, cryptography messages, private key certificate requests, personal uh, information, the elliptical curve, and cryptography tokens. Uh, ones that you typically want to look at are things like PKCS 7 and PKS 12 and 10. Simple certificate enrollment. You uh, request a certificate. You request 7 or 10. And then once they have verified, they will resend you PKCS 7 with your signed certificate. 
And as long as the person signing the certificate people trust, then we're good. If people don't trust it, that signed certificate means nothing. We have a hierarchy, typically. We have what's called a root certificate, and they may issue a certificate for signing to a, a lower level certificate authority. That prevents, so that creates a hierarchy. We can also have what's called cross certified CAs, and that's where we can actually have different CAs issuing certificates but sharing with one another. The most common is a hierarchy. You have the main certificate authorities and they have subordinate certificate authority that actually do the issuing. That way the root CAs can have more time to do what they need to do and they can actually issue Say if you want to get a certificate, visit one of these subordinates, and they'll handle that portion of it. Typically, they're called registra the registration authorities. We don't want to bog down the certificate authority with registration requests. So, you actually have an intermediary, a registration authority, that would do all of the registration functionality. And when it's done, it will do a forward to the certificate authority with the completed form, and then it will issue your certificates. Digital certificates and CAs, again, same thing. We will request our digital certificates from our CAs, typically through an intermediate RA, and that RA will do all of the registration process and we'll issue it back to the CA. The CA then would return the appropriate certificates with the appropriate serial number, date, time, name, all of that good stuff. We can also have what's called peer authenticate and they can be used to authenticate one another. Again, because we trust an entity and someone else trusts that same entity, through that entity we, to a degree, can trust one another if that entity has shown that it trusts both of us. If I get a certificate from VeriSign and you get a certificate from VeriSign, I can trust you because I trust VeriSign. And that is the end of this ch chapter in a nutshell. We looked at cryptography at a very high level. We explained the different types of keys, asymmetric, symmetric, and hashing. If you have any questions, please leave a comment below. Uh, if you have any uh, pertinent questions or uh, questions that you just want to ask, leave a comment below and I'll get to those questions as soon as I can. Thank you. You have a great day.